Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When someone makes a statement that is difficult or unreasonable, human beings rationalize in order to ignore or moderate their words. Maybe the person didn't mean it, or maybe they have some hidden strategy that explains their otherwise irrational position. Unfortunately for deniers, what a person says is what they mean. The duty of science is to be accountable and to hold each other accountable to what is actually said, not to appeal to an imaginary intended meaning or purpose. Demagoguery is the bastard child of Plato enabled by the tolerable meanings we create behind or above the stench of what is actually said. In the case of Matthew, the difficult words of Jesus are also unbearable. Beginning with Matthew 5, the Lord presents an explanation of the law of Moses that makes it literally impossible for anyone to claim that they are righteous. Some scholars argue that Jesus is exaggerating to make a point. Why? Because if Jesus meant what he said, a tautology for Semites, then literally, no one is righteous. No, not one. Jesus decimates the hope of human righteousness even as the demagogue counts on our faith in the same. That's why the words of Jesus, unlike human words, are a sweet fragrance in the Father's nostrils. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 to 6. This week's episode is offered in honor of Catherine, an Alzheimer's patient who entered hospice this week. We give thanks with her to him who remembers us in our low estate, for his mercy endures forever. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 253 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Good morning, Dr. Benton. How are you today? Good morning, Father. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm great. How are things at SBL this week? You know, it's been so good. I've been so happy to hear from the the SBL scholars who are listening to the podcast. I've had some great conversations suggestions, compliments, critiques all up and down. And, you know, it's very gratifying to hear that this is a podcast that is meaningful to so many different people. We didn't do market research. We didn't do in-depth focus groups to find out how this is going to appeal. We really are just trying to go through the Bible one verse at a time. And this is something that people are excited about. So many people in their churches are just hearing this passage or that passage. So, having verse by verse going through an entire book at a time, looking at everything in context, taking the context very seriously, and taking the Bible very seriously as a result, it has been so gratifying. And it reminds me of a saying that Father Paul told us, and I've been repeating this over and over. When you say, what does the Bible say about? This is the beginning of sin. Unless you stop at, what does the Bible say? And so, the opportunity to put together this podcast and the work that we do in this podcast just so we can all hear what the Bible says is exactly why scholars do want to study the Bible and why people want to hear Scripture. It's so that we know what the Bible says, and I'm so grateful we can continue this work. It's funny you talk about doing market research. If we were the counterinsurgency, we would be doing market research, but As Father Paul said this week on the Tuesday show, Marcos is the new hammer that replaces the Maccabean hammer, the Maccabean sword, and it's an insurgency that is waged solely 
with the sword of the spirit, which is the content of the teaching, the words inscribed in the scroll. So thank God we didn't do any market research or we would be the problem. We would not be working for the gospel of Matthew. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Now, before we launch into the unpacking of this verse, I just want to highlight how striking the word hypocrite is here in verse 5. Jesus just laid out in Matthew chapter 5 that we're all hypocrites, and now he's saying, don't be like the hypocrites. It's very difficult. And I know that we have been emphasizing something in our offline conversations. I think we touched on it in the podcast. I'm not sure. Sometimes these conversations blend back and forth. But Matthew is not hyperbole. We've talked a lot about that. People like to call it hyperbole because it lets them off the hook, and then it becomes very easy to explain away what seems to be an irrational teaching by Jesus. But he is, in fact, saying you are a hypocrite. And don't be like the hypocrites. It's powerful. It's very powerful. I mean, the first thing you have to be ready for, if you're going to be serious about Matthew, is that you are a hypocrite. If you're not ready for that critique, you won't get Matthew. You have to be able to crack your ego open and let this word enter in. Otherwise, there's no hope for you. I was talking to somebody just yesterday here at SBL, and she said, as soon as you make it hyperbole, you can do anything you want. If it actually says that you're a hypocrite, if you love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, what is this about the prayer in the schools that we need to be so serious about? If those people were actually following what Jesus said, they could only pray in the closet of the school. They can't pray in the classroom. Is this equivalent to praying in the synagogues and praying on the corner of the street, praying out in the open? Is this already the beginning of hypocrisy? Of course it is, because that's what Jesus is aiming specifically at. He is trying to decimate our piety. Any any sense of piety that we have, Jesus is trying to destroy, to eliminate, to pulverize. The point is to break open our ego. It's not hyperbole. It's prophetic teaching. The influence of Hosea in verse 5 here is palpable. If anyone can read Hosea and then feel good about going to worship at their local church, they have not read Hosea, or they've dismissed Hosea as hyperbole. He is, as you know, Richard, from your work on the text, very critical of public worship, for the same reason that Matthew is very critical of any kind of pretense. When you make a pretense, when you make an appearance, when you make a show, it says nothing about the factuality of your behavior, which will be discerned by the Lord in the judgment. So don't act humble because it's socially acceptable, because then you have your reward. Don't act anything. Just do what you are commanded to do. Don't worry about how it looks. And if there's a chance people will give you credit for it, do it in secret. If you care about making sure that everyone in the culture, everyone in the class, or all the stupid non-believers believe that you're a good Christian and that they should be a good Christian too, and they get to see how good of a Christian you are because you're praying out in the open, that is what they're saying. You have received a reward. And what's the hypocrisy? The hypocrisy is that you're saying you're following this for the sake of God, but you're not. You're following it for the sake of you, yourself, that people can say, oh, what a good person that person is, what a good representation of Christ that is, or whatever you want them to say. That is the hypocrisy. In Hosea, when you go to a place of worship and you make a sacrifice, it's visible to everybody. You are doing something that receives approval in the community. It's something that everyone can be self-congratulatory about. You went and you made an offering and you know, you have a pretty temple and the incense smells nice or whatever. And if you are not Eastern Orthodox, if you're not Roman Catholic, if you're from a tradition that doesn't use incense, just substitute, as Richard said, your insistence upon school prayer, and you'll be just fine following along. If you're from a liberal Protestant denomination, 
whose slogan is all are welcome. Remember that once you say that, you're excluding people who don't agree with you, and that makes you a Pharisee. So please, let's apply Scripture to ourselves literally. Let's not literally apply it to the others. It has to be done in secret, because in Matthew, always, it's a question of who is providing the reward. This past Sunday, some young people sang in church, and I told the community I was very, very forceful in the following statement, that no one is to compliment these young women for singing during the service. No one. Because if you compliment them, what you are doing is massaging their ego to get something from them because you want to have a nice service. You're not actually helping these young people when you pat them on the back for doing their duty. And at the same time, when you pat them on the back for doing their duty, you're skirting over the fact that there are many parents who did not have their children perform their duty in the service. Because if you praise the one who does their duty, it's a double hitter for you. You get what you want, and you give air cover for others. But fulfilling your responsibility is not something deserving of applause in Matthew. It's a responsibility. Worst of all, if you do that, you reap all this benefit from the work of these young people who sang, and at the same time, as Paul says in Galatians, you shut them out of the kingdom. Because, as Matthew teaches us, their reward is in the heavens. It's not hyperbole. It is possible to be a community where people do not publicly praise each other or publicly give thanks to other human beings. It may seem strange, and it doesn't make the community that behaves that way any better than the community that doesn't, but it is possible. But when you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And here, Rich, I want to stress your observation about the manuscript last week, and in this case, I agree with the New American Standard Bible. It does not say, will reward you openly, as does the King James translation, because the reward is not apparent and may never be apparent. When you're a young woman standing before the Roman seat of authority in the province in which you live, and your life is on the line, and you are asked to deny your faith, and you refuse to, and then you suffer a horrible, humiliating death, it's not clear that there's a reward. It's certainly not apparent. This is the setting into which this text was preached. In the Gospel of Matthew, the audience, the implied audience, let's not worry so much about historicity. Let's just understand that in the narrative arc of the Bible, there's a different audience in the Gospel of Mark than there is in the Gospel of Matthew, because Mark was written, again, within the narrative arc of the story before the destruction of the temple. I'm not talking about history. I'm talking about the narrative. And Matthew, within that narrative framework, was written after the destruction of the temple. And we just learned from Father Paul that the New Testament was written as a reaction against the Maccabees, whom the writers of the New Testament blame for the phenomenon that led to violence in the Near East and continues to result in violence because of religious fundamentalism. So Matthew was written post-destruction of the temple and is addressed in the story primarily to the Gentile leadership of the church. And that's important, Richard, to remember as we go through because Matthew will take the gloves off with respect to the Pharisees and the scribes, and we would be foolish to think he's not talking about the Gentile leaders of the Christian community. Jesus just gathered the crowds, and the author of Matthew does not distinguish who was there, because it doesn't matter who was there. This is spoken to the universal audience. This is not one group of people or the other. It specifically may apply to certain people more than others, but it was delivered to everyone. And as we've been saying today, this is meant to crack open the ego and let the word in. And the thing that I love about verse 6 is that prayer only can be rewarded if it's done where no human being can see it. I mean, in Hosea, the Lord doesn't allow prayer in public at all. He has no need for our temples. He actually disdains them. 
Now, the writer of Hosea was wise because he knew that no matter how hard he pushed back against cultic worship, human beings were going to insist upon it because of their desire for security. And so, while smashing it, he pushed the statue aside, which is what the prophets do, and replaced it with a scroll. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God instead of whole burnt offerings. That's a highly functional teaching in Matthew. And when you go into your room to pray in secret, we'll see very soon that the prayer that is assigned by the Lord is specific and technical. And for us, when we meditate on that prayer, which we'll talk about probably next week, Rich, we won't get to the Lord's Prayer today, but when we meditate on that prayer, we are meditating upon the precepts of the Lord. So the way that Jesus is talking about prayer in Matthew, he's talking about going into a place where no one can see you doing the work, opening the scroll, and reciting the words that he's going to put into your ear or put into your mouth, if we're thinking in terms of the metaphor of Ezekiel, so that when you open your mouth to speak, the words are already there. So the work is Bible study when he's talking about prayer. That's the work. And that work has to take place in all of our homes at all times so that the Lord, through his instruction, can do his work for our sake. What I love about this passage also is that it doesn't let you off the hook. It doesn't say, don't waste your time praying. No, you still have to pray, but you have to do it in such a way that nobody knows. The beauty of it is that you can't interpret Jesus to make it easier on you somehow. It's always going to be harder because Jesus is showing you the level you have to hit if you really want to not be a hypocrite and you really want to be righteous. Now, the end result, nevertheless, is that we're all hypocrites and none of us are righteous. That's the space that we find ourselves in if we take Jesus's teaching seriously. And this has been what I've told my fellow scholars of the Bible at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature, that has been so valuable to me in reading this, is that Jesus does not give you any space to breathe. And that has been what I've gathered from reading verse by verse through Matthew. So I hope that you feel, as listeners, the crush of Jesus's demands on you and therefore your need of mercy for Jesus, because that is the only way you can possess righteousness if Jesus's father, the judge, allows you to be righteous and you depend 100% on him. Richard, this is very personal, but it's at the moments of my life when I felt there were no options, when I felt that I was effectively in the position of a Roman slave. No options, no voice, and no horizon in sight for relief. I'm not talking about how I felt. I'm talking about being in a situation where you truly don't have options and you've run out of choices. In those situations, where you're effectively trapped and all you have is the work of the gospel, then you can only begin to understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew. Because the people that hear Matthew are people with options. The majority of the people who hear the gospel are not Roman slaves. They're not the oppressed. They're not a Syrian Muslim immigrant who has no place to lay his head. They're usually people who have options, who can choose what service time is most convenient for them, who have a watch that they can afford, that they can look at during the sermon because they're bored. These are the people who hear Matthew, and these are the people that the Lord is desperately trying to reach with the situation of the slave, the one who has to do all of the work and get none of the glory. That is Matthew. It's ominous. How can we raise people in the wise instruction of this teaching in a society that's all about show and tell and all about praise and all about glory? It's not that other societies weren't about these things. We know from Ecclesiastes, that nothing changes under the sun. What is different is that in our worship of the market, we have perfected vice as virtue. So when I say to the community, do not compliment the singers after the service, I'm very serious. And, you know, it's the hammer of the Gospel of Mark, the metaphoric hammer, the anti-Maccabean hammer that's nonviolent. It's the 
insurgency of the sword of the spirit, which is simply pushing back with God's wisdom against our selfishness and our self-serving behaviors. Self-serving behaviors is exactly the problem because when you say, oh, thank you, it's cheap. Better not to say anything and help them with their chanting, help them with their singing. Maybe you sing as well. Maybe you do some work. Maybe if they had an extra singer, it would be less of a burden on them. So maybe rather than saying thank you and looking good and looking like a nice person, you actually did the actions it would take in order to make their job easier. Maybe that's what you should do. But that's when it becomes not cheap. That's when it becomes an investment you have to make. There are ways of being grateful in your heart that are cheap. But when you're grateful in your actions, it actually is meaningful. And the words are on the cheap side. They're not on the action side. When a scholar talks about Matthew being hyperbolic and explains how Jesus didn't really mean what he said, he was just speaking the way we Arabs speak with emphasis to make a point. It's, it's, <laughs> not only is it cheap, but it's in a way racist. It betrays a kind of Orientalism. Oh, yeah, that's the way Semites talk. They exaggerate. It's insulting, actually, the more I think about it, Rich. But when you do that, you are imposing your low standard on your brothers and sisters. Because human beings, although they're not supposed to know it, because that's our downfall is our pride, at the same time, we all know that human beings have done amazing things in history. And when a teacher like Matthew puts in the instruction of Jesus this impossible standard, it produces results. On the one hand, you can't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. And you can never take credit for what you're doing or feel good about what you're doing, or think that you're right in what you're doing, because all of those things lead to destruction. But at the same time, you're not off the hook to not be a hypocrite, even though you can't not be a hypocrite. This teaching, this seed, works on the human conscience and produces in different people different results. And I am always surprised and humbled by the results. The results are attributed to the teaching of Matthew, but God forbid, as Paul says, me genito, God forbid that any of us would in any way, shape, or form try to tamp down or moderate the very difficult teaching of Jesus by calling it hyperbole. In this discussion we've been having, Richard, offline, you really hit on a critical point because it's cheap talk. You have to be perfect as your father is perfect. And I know why people don't like it because they want to complain about their mom and their dad and how they wrecked their life. But that's vain talk also, because there's work to do. Do you think a Roman slave in the first century had time to go to their therapist and explain how their mom was mean to them when they were little? No, because the master would kill them for not doing their chores. Praise the Lord that you and I don't live in that historical situation, but shame on us if we don't honor the life of those forgotten slaves by making good use of the time, as Paul says, because the days are evil. So it's good to chat today, Richard. This was a more relaxed format today because I wanted to hear a bit about SBL. It sounds like it's going well, and you've had some lively interactions with your colleagues. Thank God. It's been a great time to put the Bible as Literature podcast into this context of scholarly research, and it's rewarding to continue this work so that others can hopefully learn what Matthew is saying. The mission of the Orthodox Center for the Advancement of Biblical Studies and OCAB's Press is to bridge the gap between the work of scholarship and the work of pastoring, of shepherding. Of course, Father Paul and his students, all of our colleagues, have always insisted that the work that scholars do has to be translated to daily life. We have to find a way to re-engage the members of our various churches with the scholarly study of the Bible. So I'm really happy that you're making those connections for this work, and I hope that many of our friends at SBL will consider doing their own podcast, because we need to do as much as possible on as many fronts 
it's very important for the sake of the community and for the common good. And you mentioned we might have the chance to interview some of the folks you've been dialoguing with, Richard, and I look forward to doing that. We might even take a pause one week from Matthew just to hear from other scholars and what they're doing. So I'll look forward to hearing more about that in future discussions. Yes, I look forward also, Father, to talking to these scholars to hear their contributions to this effort that we're trying to make to get this teaching out to all audiences. Thanks very much, Rich. Have a great week and travel safely. Thank you very much, Father. Take care. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.